What I wanted to talk about now is something that, again, I don't think people get enough information about. Um, it's like when you get a diagnosis like this, there should be like a little course that you go through, like, what should I ask my doctor? What does it mean to be a clinical trial? How can I get the best care? How do I find a specialist? How do I deal with insurance? Almost like there should be some courses, right? And one of the courses should be about clinical trials because a lot of people hear about clinical studies and they don't know what they are. They don't know if they're dangerous. Um, and hopefully this will be a little bit of background as to what a clinical trial is, why they're important, what you should expect when somebody talks to you about a clinical trial. So you've heard already from Dr. Molitarno, and you'll hear over the course of the rest of the day that there's a lot of new medicines that are coming up and possible in myeloproliferative neoplasm. So how do you get access to them? How do you know if it's right, the right time for you to be in a trial? and um, how to think about them, and that's what this talk is going to be about. So this is a clinical trial. This is not what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about a clinical trial, not a courtroom trial. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about whether or not you're going to get the right medicine, and I want to talk about that, like what does it mean to be in a trial and when should you think about the placebo? And then also the question of am I going to be a guinea pig? And I put this up there just because that's super cute, right? <laughs> Um, I don't want anybody to feel that they're a guinea pig. I want them to know why you would consider a trial and what, basically what's in it for you. Um, so we can't talk about clinical trials in the United States or anywhere without talking about the fact that there is a huge number, not huge, but there are several examples of situations where physicians and, uh, have behaved in an incredibly malicious and unethical way in the most grievous example of that is the Tuskegee experiment. So this was an exper uh, something um, done by the Public Health Service but in the early part of this century, ended only, if you can believe it, in 1972, where a number of impoverished African Americans who had a diagnosis of syphilis were followed to know the natural history of syphilis without giving penicillin, even though penicillin was proven to be beneficial and curing syphilis early on in the course of this. So these gentlemen were not told that, hey, by the way, we're following you, but there's a new cure and you should actually get that cure. And they were followed so they understood what happened to it. So this, which is called the infamous Tuskegee experiment, is one of the things that has really driven an extremely um, thorough and I would say um, a very extensive understanding of what constitutes ethical trials. It's not the only one, although it's the most important, it's the most famous. There's also an example for um, this Willowbrook State School is an example of physicians who intentionally inoculated individuals with cognitive disabilities with hepatitis to see how the disease was transmitted. And there's also a, a physician who is known here in New York uh, who gave, who unwittingly gave uh, skin cancerous cells into people's skins to see what happened, again, without informing them. So each of these examples we learn about in medical school and elsewhere about one of the reasons why all of the ideas of consent, of informed consent, of a dynamic process of keeping individuals engaged in the clinical trial process and everything that you guys go through when you sign a consent, when you're talked about, grows out of the protections that exist for patients who participate in clinical trials now. We can always get better, but I would say that these, t these incredibly horrific events have informed a clinical trial process now that is very patient, is really good at engaging patients in their own safety. So there's a lot of, we discuss this because there's a lot of misinformation out there and because it's ethical to inform patients what a trial is long before they need to know if they should be in one. So what is a clinical trial? That's what we're going to talk about. What kind of oversight is there for subjects? Why should you consider participating? What are the key things to learn before I sign on the dotted line? So let's focus on clinical trials in myeloproliferative neoplasms. So it's, it might be easy to think, well, a clinical trial is you give somebody a pill and determine if it works better. But really, what we measure in terms of a medical intervention depends on what's important for the disease. And so for MPNs, what we really want to know is, is there something that we can do that can improve the quality of life? 
Is there something that we can improve that stops bleeding or th stops thrombosis or helps itching, which is this thing called puritis? And in myeloproliferative neoplasms, as many of you know, this medicine called ruxolitinib was tested and found to be beneficial by the primary endpoint, which is the main thing that those investigators were looking for, because it decreased spleen size. Now, on the side of that, the investigators were also saying, well, let's see if it does something other than just decrease the spleen. Could it improve quality of life, and how would we measure that? So that's how they came up with these surveys, and everybody that was on that test uh, on that clinical trial, not only did they have their spleen measured, but they also had these surveys done, and it turned out that there was a beneficial effect of ruxolitinib on the overall quality of life as measured by symptoms. So the most important thing on a clinical trial is, what are they measuring? What are we going to change with this intervention that we're going to do? So a clinical trial asks the question, can a certain medical intervention impact an outcome? And that's vague. Maybe that medical intervention is you take a pill, like ruxolitinib. But maybe that medical intervention is um, you uh, do some um, self-hypnosis before a surgery. They did that with a clinical trial on breast cancer where they had patients who were about to have um, breast cancer surgery and they put half of them through a meditation course and had them do that before the surgery. And it turned out the people that went through the, med the, um, the, the meditation course versus those who didn't had a lot less pain postoperatively, for example. So any kind of medical intervention can be studied, and then any kind of outcome can be studied. And sometimes that outcome is, do I live longer, or do the people who got the intervention live longer? That's the classic one. But sometimes it's something like blood pressure, or spleen size, or how you rate a given symptom. And then, so for example, does a new pill prevent spleen growth in patients with myelofibrosis might be the question. This is the intervention, and this is the outcome. But it doesn't just jump right to there. It has to go through stages. So this new pill, it, first question is, is the pill safe for humans? And that means the pill needs to be given first to animals. And then it needs to be given to humans who are generally well, people who don't have myelofibrosis. Can we safely administer this to human? And that's called a first in human study. And then you need to take that pill and say, is this pill safe in people with a specific cancer? Because we know that patients with a specific cancer may not, it may not be as safe. And also, what's the right dose? There's one dose that's been measured in mice or rats, and there's another dose that's been given to dogs, and now we have to find the dose in humans. So the first thing is a first in human study, and then this section is a phase one study. And the phase one study is where it's the first time this pill has been given, and the first group of patients might get a little baby, baby dose, and the next group of patients might give a slightly higher dose, and then the next group of patients might get a very high dose, and maybe they have toxicities. And so then the people deciding this say, well, that's too high. It's kind of a Goldilocks question. What's just right? After this, then they take the pills at this dose and give it to the patients that have the disease they're interested in and say, does it make any difference? Does there any kind of response? Do we see the spleen grow? Do we see that they, that we have any hints that this is going to work? So that's called a phase two study. That's where the medicine's given at a dose that's been decided in phase one. To the, to the right patient population. And this is also where specific toxicities come out. And this might be, well, it turns out that this pill uh, causes heart failure. Or it turns out that this pill causes, there was one study that we looked at doing, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, not in myelofibrosis, but in leukemia. But individuals developed this strange greenish tint to their skin. And, you know, it wasn't dangerous, but people turned green like, like Wizard of Oz, Wicked Witch of the West Green. So that's not a drug that's going to go on, right? That's, that's, that's a weird toxicity that only occurred here when a large number of patients got the right dose. Um, does the, and then the last question is, does the pill work better than the current standard of care? So if my standard of care is to give people pill number three, at a dose of two pills a day. And then I had this new thing that came out of phase two, and I say, well, is 
pill number six better than pill number three? And, or is it the same? Or at what, is it, God, does it have some other benefit? And that's called phase three. So phase two is where everybody gets the medicine, more or less, and it looks at responses and toxicities. And phase three is where people are randomized to what you would otherwise get versus something new. So this is described in these fancy words. So phase one trials are in healthy volunteers. Drug doses start very low and they're escalated. And sometimes this phase one is done in healthy and sometimes it's done in the patients that actually have the disease. Phase two trials get an initial read of efficacy. Just is there a hint that this is actually gonna work? And does it have a safety pr problem in these groups of patients? Phase three trials are large trials and they are usually done to determine whether or not the drug is gonna be approved by the Food and Drug Administration. The drugs here aren't approved by the FDA. This is all about getting the drug approved by the FDA and it usually it's either versus placebo or versus the best available, I mean, what's the current standard of care? What would I do with you if you didn't have this disease? And then I'm gonna randomize you to that versus this new intervention. There's also phase four, and phase four speaks to the fact that there's plenty of medicines that are approved by the FDA, and then when they're generally used in the larger population, they don't send to work as well. And that's maybe because the trial wasn't designed very well, or because the approval was very narrow and doctors use the drug very widely. So phase four studies are looking at what really is happening in the real world. So what, who oversees clinical trials? Well, first is the Food and Drug Administration. They do audits. Every new drug needs to go through this thing called an investigational new drug review. And these are guided by these things called the Nuremberg Code, which developed after World War II and the use by the Nazis of um, prisoners and otherwise uh, people without um, any kind of uh, agency as experiments, the Declaration of Helsinki, and the Belmont Report. These are sort of the underpinnings of the legal protections for patients who are on clinical trials. In addition, the local institutions guide our care of patients. Every trial needs to go through what's called a scientific review committee, meaning that we're doing a trial that really has some reason to be performed. If I said, you know, I want to do a trial where I make 15 people uh, stand on their head and see if it improves sleep. And I just thought about that yesterday. Well, no, it needs to have a real scientific basis to conduct it. And that means that every trial needs to have a reason to be done and that needs to be reviewed by the peers of the person who's written the trial. Institutional review boards go over and make sure that patients who are on the trial are adequately consented. And again, understand the reason why they're doing it. There's something called a data, data safety monitoring committee. These are done both at a local level and sometimes at an organizational or national level so that at periodic times during the course of a study, uh, the patients are looked at to say, is this safe to continue? And then there's also financial disclosures um, so that a person who's getting paid by uh, a company to do a trial isn't uh, going to influence the results. Industry now does a lot of um, trials, and that's partially because uh, many, they've invested the re research and development dollars into new medicines and new things coming out, and also because the dollars that are going to federal funding, like the National Cancer Institute and the NIH, taxpayer dollars have been cut quite a bit. So the research motivation is now largely in industry, which then reaps the benefits of some of these. And finally, trial design, so when you write a trial, you basically build in, hey, we're gonna stop it when it's clear that either the medicine works well enough so we don't have to try it anymore, or the medicine or the intervention is not safe enough to pursue. So why should you f consider participating in a clinical trial? And I would say there's different calculations based on the different kinds of trials you're looking at. So let's start first with a phase three study. Like I said, a phase three study is where you might be randomized to a new medicine versus a med the standard of care. And I would say participating in a phase three study should be because you want to get access to something that you think is really going to be a home run or something that you really have an idea is gonna work. And I think in a phase three study, even though it's randomized, 
you have one of the best chances of benefiting from participating. And that's because, first off, you have a 50% chance when the coin is flipped to getting something novel that in phase two studies was at least proven pretty, pretty good, right? Like, not to sound like, um, what's that guy, Dave? Pretty, pretty, pretty good. What, what's his name? Larry David, right? <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty good uh, in the phase two study. So if you're in the, if you get to a phase three study, that means there's enough people out there that this think this is, this might be pretty good. And so if you go into it, you have a, a, a chance of getting on that, a half a chance. And in addition, many phase three studies have something called a crossover, which means that if you end up not being on the investigational agent and you for some reason get worse or develop something problematic, you can switch over and you can get the investigational medicine. So again, there's a benefit. I think the phase three study is the, is the study where you have the most chance of benefiting. Phase two studies are, I usually recommend phase two studies when I don't think the standard of care is very good. Where I say, you know, we've already been through the entire standard of care. What's out there is not looking good for you. So I think we need to get you on to some phase two studies so we can see if this is something that's going to work for you. So I tend to, in patients who move to phase two studies, I tend to do that when I'm, when I'm really searching for something new for them, or then where the standard has either caused too much toxicity, et cetera. Phase, many people can be on several phase two studies, first one, then another, then another. And phase two studies are usually where I'm trying to send people, sometimes I send people to a site where I don't have the phase two study, but I say, look, I see down in Chicago there's one, or I see in Ohio there's a phase two study of a new drug that I think is going to look pretty good. Now, again, it's guesswork. This is the first time this has been used in a large number or a larger number of people. But generally, in a phase two study, there's no randomization. Everybody gets the medicine. So if you're going to invest in going someplace for that study, you know that you're going to actually be in the interventional arm. In a phase one study, you've got to remember about being in a phase one study. The first thing is that we don't know the right dose yet. So you may be getting a mini baby dose of some new medicine. There's, even if the medicine eventually is a home run, there's no idea that the dose you're on is the right dose. The second thing about a phase one study is that we really don't have a hint of whether or not it's going to work. We might have a hint from the lab experiments or from early, early stuff, but we really don't know. So when people go on a phase one study, I emphasize to them that being on a phase one is about helping other people. If nobody had been on that first phase one study above Jacophy, uh, that ruxolitinib wouldn't be approved now. If nobody had been on a phase one study of interferon, we wouldn't be using interferon. And so this is really altruistic. And I really think carefully about patients uh, before I put people on a phase one study. But again, it's in the right situation, it's a good option. And I also want to emphasize a lot of people find a great deal of personal gratification in being part of the, f of the clinical trials uh, and discovery. And um, so think about that also, the value that it adds to your life. In no situation is anybody going to put you in danger. And so that's what the consent process is about. So what are the barriers to participating? Lack of information about trials. I don't want to be a guinea pig. This was my chance to put Mr. Guinea Pig up again. Uh, time, travel, or financial constraints. And these are real situations. If you have to travel six hours by plane and nobody's going to cover your costs of travel, then it's very hard to be on a clinical trial. And so that's why uh, it's important to think about those. And logistical constraints are real. Concern about getting an ineffective dose, randomization. The sometimes you get all the way down there and they say, oh, I'm sorry, you're not eligible. That's something that shouldn't happen. You should know about your eligibility before you get there or before you travel. And that's something your doctor can work on with you. Sometimes trials don't exclude, exclude people who are older uh, or who have certain other disabilities, which is too bad because eventually we want these medicines to work in everybody. And then sometimes referring doctors say, ah, it's just not worth it which is unfortunate because there's a lot of, like I said, to each stage of, of trial, there's benefit, maybe to you, maybe to other people. And this kind of question of whether or not you want to be in a trial should be left to the patient, not just to the referring doctor. So what happens when you go on a trial? 
The first thing that happens is you sign an informed consent. And then your doctor looks and makes sure once you've signed the consent, then we do something called screening to make sure that the disease, your blood counts, your kidney function, your liver function, your bone marrow, all looks appropriate for being in that trial. Then you start the drug. Sometimes you're randomized. Sometimes everybody gets the drug. Now, you are monitored extremely carefully when you're in a trial, and that's part of that oversight. So you might get a lot more blood tests than you would get otherwise. You might have more doctor's appointments than you would get otherwise, and those things are usually required by the study. And so if you get a toxicity or a side effect, sometimes the medicine is paused or it's dose reduced in some way. Then there's the end of treatment. So once treatment is over, those study results should be, uh, should be should be published, but more importantly, you should, you should get the results of those. So I put some patients on a study of a medicine called procritinib one time, which was stopped, and then I, once I got the results of that, I sat down with the people and I said, this is what was published, and this is, this is why it was stopped, and these are the reasons that the FDA gave to stop it. And I think if you participate in a clinical trial, one of the things that you should do is make sure your doctor talks to you about what the results were. Informed consent is the first step, and that requires that the person who's uh, meeting with you goes, uh, discloses uh, exactly what is the information that they have to allow you to make the decision. You have to be able to understand it, which means that if you speak another language, we need to give it to you in your language, and it needs to be written at a something that's not going to go over your head. That means your doctor really needs to sit with you and say, this is why I think you should go over on, it, on it, and this is why I think it's a good idea. You have to be able to have the capacity. In my, uh, it's very difficult to put somebody on a clinical trial if they have, um, if they're, for example, have a significant cognitive impairment or if, they're, if they have dementia, for example. Those people shouldn't be on a clinical trial because they don't have the capacity to volunteer to be, to, to have, be exposed to possible toxicities. Again, they need to be able to volunteer with their own decision making and they shouldn't be coerced, either financially coerced, I'll pay you $1,000 on you go on this trial, or coerced because, um, beca because well, I, this would really help us, you should really be on this trial. So you need, this needs to be something, you need to know that your doctor has no dog in this fight. Your doctor just wants what's best for you and so they shouldn't be influencing you to sign. And the informed consent should then go over how the trial is conducted, what parts are experimental. If I'm going to give you everything that's a standard of care, plus I'm going to add that you stand on your head for three minutes every day, that's the experimental part, the standing on the head. And so somebody needs to clarify what is, what's, what is being tested. What are your rights about it? What are the alternatives? What would I do if you weren't on this trial? what medicines are being paid for by the trial and what is going to be paid for by your insurance company. What's the schedule? How often will you have to be here? What's the calendar look like? It's important to um, indicate that this is completely voluntary, voluntary, and it's not a contract. So I tell people all the time, signing this consent form, this is not a marriage. You can get out of it any time you want. It's a discussion, and that means that if you ever say, look, I don't want to do this anymore. It's over, right? There's no, it's not, a, it's not a commitment. It's a discussion. It's a dynamic process. So it's pretty complicated to talk, especially if your doctor walks in and they've got 17 things in front of you and you're like, whew, I can't understand. That's why another important part of this policy is don't sign a consent on the first day you walk in and you're given it. Take it home. Read it. Put some sticky notes on it call, say, oh, I was question, can we over, go over page four? Can we go over what they say? What do they mean here about this risk? So consent should be thought about, and it should be something that you carefully consider. There is an exception to that. So sometimes I have people sign a consent form because I want to determine if they're eligible and we have to do a test. So let's say you have acute myeloid leukemia and I have a clinical trial for that, but I need to verify that you'd be consent that you'd be will that you'd be able to do it before you get a bone marrow biopsy. So there are cases where I'll say, look, I, I'm really interested in this trial for you, but I don't know if you're eligible and we won't know until you get this bone marrow biopsy. So let's have you sign the consent then we'll do the bone marrow biopsy and see if you're eligible. And if you read it over and you don't want to do it, we'll rip it up. 
So there are some situations where your doctor might have you sign the consent before you've been able to fully realize it, but you should only do that if you know that it's sort of um, probationary, okay? Screening, then this is a part I talked about where they really determine whether or not you're eligible for the trial. And these are some examples of what you might go through for what's called eligibility. Do you fit the criteria of intermediate and high risk myelofibrosis and is your spleen bigger than five? Or is your kidney function good and your liver function good? Well, have you ever had a prior treatment in the last 14 days, example? So these are the kind of things that once you sign the consent, then people go over these eligibility and oftentimes we go over those before you sign consent just so we can get an idea of whether or not this is the right trial for you. This is what I mean by calendar. When you come in for a, a clinical trial, you should know the calendar before you sign consent. These little arrows here mean every doctor visit. Well, if you live 600 miles away and you're coming in five times in the first 28 days and then two times in the next 28 days, et cetera, this might be pretty cumbersome for you. And this also says, well, you have to get a bone marrow biopsy after three months and another one after six months. This says on the first day, this, this says, what this means is you have to get blood tests done for the first seven hours. So the first day you're gonna be here for at least nine hours. That's the kind of calendar that your doctor should give you so that you know what to expect when you come in. And this also means that, well, if I'm gonna be traveling 350 miles a day for the first month, maybe I should stay at my daughter's house in Milwaukee so that I don't have to drive back and forth. And those are the types of logistical considerations that your doctor should help you figure out. And in a typical visit on a clinical trial, just like a regular trial, you get your test results, you do some more advanced um, record of your abnormal lo uh, blood results and your adverse events. We decide whether or not you're gonna stay on that drug, and then we decide whether or not that intervention, whatever it is, is actually working for you. And so this trial visit is relatively um, protocol driven and they might say, you might go in and your doctor says, well, you're cycle three, day one, and on this day we're gonna check the following labs and we're also gonna do some specialized measurements so you're gonna go get a CT scan. And that's often driven by what the protocol, which is the clinical trial, says needs to happen. This is what happened at the end of treatment, and again, sometimes people stay on it, uh, stay on the drug for a given period of time, and if it's working, many protocols say, look, if you're benefiting from this drug, we'll let you stay on it, even if the trial finishes. So that's another thing to ask when you get on a trial. Can I stay on it if it's working for me? Um, it, of course, people come off if there's unacceptable toxicity, or if you're on a trial and it's found that in 100 people, 20 people have this very bad toxicity, and you haven't had that, but 20 people have, and the company says this is too dangerous, then everybody comes off the trial, whether or not you have that toxicity or not, okay? And that's another reason why the physicians need to keep informed. What would you do to be on a trial? Well, uh, uh, really, I, re I say that a patient on a clinical trial needs to really engage. They need to know why they're on it, and be able to be voluntarily engaged in the process. So they understand why they're on it, that they're adherent to the medicine and the schedule, and that you are really telling us what's going on because we need to know any new or concerning symptoms. And make sure that your partner's with the family and that you keep a good diary of what's going on and advocate for yourself. You wanna make sure before you sign a clinical trial that you're not gonna be paid anything, that nobody's gonna be charged anything extra. It goes without saying that if the study drug is being investigated, it needs to be covered by whoever's the entity supporting that trial, not by your insurance company, for example. And you wanna make sure that you clarify any labs or procedures are paid for. The insurance only covers the standard of care and then the trial should cover anything that's extra. And sometimes lodging or travel is, de de is uh, reimbursement is possible, but no, at no point should a doctor pay you to be on that study because that's part of coercement. You can be reimbursed um, for participating in a survey, but not $1,000. If you participate in a survey and it takes you an hour, maybe somebody will give you a $5 gift card, right? It has to be, um, it has to be relatively appropriate for the amount of time that you spend. 
And the last thing I want to point out is that there's a lot of vernacular in clinical trials, things like open label, these kind of things. You want to uh, ask about that. So if it's open label, that, that is a phrase that means you're going to know if you're getting the placebo or not. If it's double-blinded, that means nobody knows if you're getting the placebo or not. If it's single-blinded, it means you don't know, but your doctor knows. So these are the types of phrases that you want to ask your doctor about. If you see it in a trial, highlight it and bring it up and say, hey, can you explain this to me? I don't understand what placebo control means. Well, placebo control means it's a phase three trial and that this new medicine, you're either going to get the new medicine or you're going to get a sugar pill. And the reason that we're doing that is so we don't um, artificially assign response to something that's not there. And crossover design, that means that if, you fa if the drug that you're on doesn't work for you, you can move to the other one. So anytime you see a phrase that you don't understand, ask about it. So there's lots of ways to know what clinical trials are out there. You can go through, like we've talked about, the MPN Research Foundation or uh, Anne's group. These places know the trials out there. One of the best ways is to look on a search engine called www.clinicaltrials.gov. Every clinical trial in, in nationally and most of in the rest of the world have to be registered here. And so you can search what's available for essential thrombocythemia or what's available for myelofibrosis. Is there something in my state? Is there something in my region? Something I can ask my doctor about. You can also look through uh, any of these other sources. And patient support groups, often best, one of the best ways to get hints on what is coming up, and I actually find that is from the patients who say, well, they're testing this drug there, why don't you have it? And so that's something that I learn about. Um, so I would really uh, recommend that. Um, I think that's my last slide. I just want to thank Jason Gottlieb. He shared many of these slides with me. And then really want to thank all of you guys because patient engagement is why we're as far along and that curve that Allison showed about everything that's happening and all the publication, that's because of the work from people like you. Thank you.